Tonight, former DNC chairman and Pennsylvania governor Ed Rendell, he joins to discuss last night's debate and the state of the Democratic Party. Then Roger Stone, he found out his sentence today, 40 months he'll get, which is less than half of what prosecutors recommended before Attorney General William Barr intervened. A former federal prosecutor who says Barr has got to go. He'll join us to explain why. Also, we're getting new information on the pardons President Trump just issued, and what we're learning makes him even more questionable. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Michael Bloomberg, he finally faced off against the Democratic field last night, and he probably wishes he didn't accept the invitation to debate in Vegas. His competitors, they teed off on the former New York City mayor, and he struggled to fend off the attacks. I'd like to talk about who we're running against. A billionaire who calls women fat broads and horse-faced lesbians. And no, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm talking about Mayor Bloomberg. From the very first minutes of his debate debut, Michael Bloomberg under blistering attack. The front runner, Senator Bernie Sanders, eager to take on the newcomer. I believe in democratic socialism okay, for enough. working people, not billionaires. The billionaire pressed on allegations he made sexist comments. None of them accused me of doing anything other than maybe they didn't like the joke I told. Bloomberg tried to explain, but it wasn't enough for his rivals. In City Hall, the person, that's the top person, my deputy mayor, was a woman, and 40% of our commissioners were women. I hope you heard what his defense was. I've been nice to some women. Also a top target, Bloomberg's record as mayor of New York City and the controversial stop and frisk program. Mr. Bloomberg had policies in New York City of stop and frisk, which went after African American and Latino people in an outrageous way. His apology, again, falling flat. I've asked for forgiveness, but the bottom line is that we stopped too many people. It's not whether he apologized or not, it's the policy. The policy was abhorrent. Bloomberg isn't even on the ballot in Nevada, and he hasn't won any delegates, but he's already spent a record-breaking $400 million just on campaign ads and argues he's best positioned to beat Trump. But Sanders, he's surging nationally with a double-digit lead. The two, they're at fundamental odds. Mike Bloomberg owns more wealth than the bottom 125 million Americans. That's wrong, that's immoral. We're not gonna throw out capitalism. We tried that, other countries tried that. It was called communism and it just didn't work. Let's talk about democratic socialism, not communism, Mr. Bloomberg, that's a cheap shot. And for more on all this, let's bring in Ed Rendell, former governor of Pennsylvania, former head of the DNC, and so much more. I can't think of a better person to talk about this. Hey, Governor, uh, forget stop and frisk. Bloomberg got mugged last night. Um, are you more surprised that he either wasn't prepared for what was coming or that he played defense for two hours? A little bit surprised, but not that much. Remember, Mike Bloomberg, the last time he ran for office, was in 2009 when the Phillies were playing the Yankees in the World Series. So a little bit out of practice. But I don't think they prepared well. His answer on the uh, non-disclosure agreements uh, and the sexual harassment charges was not a good answer. Uh, he, he didn't seem to be expecting things that should have been fairly obvious. Um, he did better in the second hour, and he gave a very good answer on climate change. But it's usually the first hour that's really the most important part of the debate. So he did get mugged. Look, will it administer significant damage to him? No, because there's another debate coming up in a week. And you remember Joe Biden had that awful first debate when Kamala Harris beat him up, and he dropped in the polls from 31, 32 down to 20. Then he did okay in the second debate and went right back to 30. So these debates can help. It's a good thing Mike Bloomberg isn't on the ballot in Nevada because that's where I think it would have had the most immediate impact. So he can recover from this, but it was a poor performance. It was funny. Um, people were saying, oh, great, he qualified for the debate. And just like any shiny new thing, it's always great until you see it up close. I was wondering if, in retrospect, um, this isn't Monday morning quarterback, and I thought that he might have been better off not being on the stage, but then there's the argument he's going to, He's going to get it one way or the other the first time he steps on the stage with these other candidates. Maybe it's better to get it out of the way now, but I was just shocked, given some of the smart people he's got working with him. He wasn't better prepared after two weeks of debate prep. 
Yeah, I, I was too. And you're right, Kevin Cheeky is probably one of the smartest people in politics. Howard Wilson, he's got a great crew working for him. And again, he can recover from this. It was certainly a bad introduction to a lot of voters. The big question in the short run is, Joe Biden needs to win South Carolina, right? If he wins South Carolina and does okay in Nevada, uh, he, he lives to fight on Super Tuesday. Mike Bloomberg would probably, from a strategic standpoint, want Joe Biden to get out of the race. But Joe Biden's strength in South Carolina has always been African-American votes. But Mayor Bloomberg has been coming on so strongly that he's taken some of that African-American support away from Joe Biden. Now, if African-Americans saw that debate, didn't like his answer on redlining, didn't like his answer on stop and frisk, they may go back to Biden, enabling Biden to win in South Carolina. And that would be harmful to the Bloomberg game plan, which is to get as many of the other moderates out as quickly as possible. To that end, uh, do you think, depending how Nevada and to a greater degree South Carolina goes, we might see an earlier exit um, from one of the two guys you mentioned, I know you're a supporter of Vice President Biden, in that there's a real concern, I don't think it's manufactured, that the moderates better figure out something sooner than later here because, I mean, I can't believe we're saying this in the middle of February, but Bernie Sanders is clearly the front runner right now. A socialist at the top of the ticket in 2020 would have been considered insane, but now it's if not very possible, almost probable. Uh, do they almost have to clear the decks and pick one moderate early in this process before Super Tuesday? Well, it would be good if they could do that, but the timing makes that almost virtually impossible. South Carolina votes four days before uh, Super Tuesday. There's not enough time for people to drop out effectively from the Super Tuesday states. And you're right, it's a problem. To, to give you an example of the problem, under Democratic Party rules, you can't get any delegates in a congressional district. And delegates are awarded in congressional districts, not necessarily on statewide performance. But you can't qualify for any delegates unless you get over 15 percent. There's a poll in California that has, the most recent poll, that has Sanders at 31 percent, Biden next at 15, and everyone else, Buttigieg, Klobuchar, Bloomberg, under 14, 13, 12, 11, which would mean if Biden slipped a half a percentage point in a lot of those congressional districts, nobody would get any delegates. And California has 415 delegates. And assume Bernie got 300 of them. He'd have an enormous 200, 250 vote lead. So yes, it, it would be in the, the benefit of the moderates. But there isn't a moderate party. There's no one in control of the moderates. No one can tell Amy Klobuchar or Pete Buttigieg or Joe Biden to get out of the race. Nobody can tell Mike Bloomberg to get out of the race. He's an independent contractor. So it may well be that we're hurtling down the road to that uh, prospect. Now, the one ray of hope for moderates is Elizabeth Warren, I thought, did very well last night. She has had uh, mediocre performances and didn't perform well in Iowa and got slaughtered in New Hampshire. She was sharing the progressive vote with Bernie, but Bernie was dominating the progressive vote, and Elizabeth looked like she was fading away. If Elizabeth comes back, that may take the Bernie vote down a peg. We'll have to see. Put on your DNC hat. Um, I know people who go back four years ago said, hey, listen, I can't vote for Trump. I'm a Republican. I can't vote for Trump. Um, and it's just a bridge too far. Certainly, we heard a lot of elected Republicans saying that around this time. I'm hearing some Democrats saying, I, I don't care. As much as I hate Trump, I can't get behind a socialist. Bernie Sanders, are you kidding me? I can't do it. Either I'll stay home or I don't know what I'll do, but I'm not going to vote for the guy. Talk about the down ticket worries. Um, I mean, you. Theoretically, well, Democrats could take the Senate back. The idea, Bernie Sanders at the top of the ticket, in a lot of purple states or even red states, would be an anathema. It's the socialist label. Trump already started in the State of the Union attacking socialists. So he wants to pin the socialist label on any Democrat who wins, but he obviously can do it easily with Bernie because Bernie calls himself a socialist. The label is a problem, and the policies are a problem. There are 160 million Americans who have private health insurance. Let's assume that 
60 million of it hate their private insurance companies and would be willing to go into a Medicare for All program. But 100 million of them, union members and the like, have good health care plans. They don't want to leave them for a government-run program because between now and November, you will see ads put on by the industry. And by the time Americans vote, they'll think government programs in other countries are awful. There's, you can't choose your own doctor. There's in, interminable waiting, inadequate care, et cetera, et cetera, things that aren't necessarily true. But so someone goes in and says, geez, I hate what Donald Trump's done, but I don't want to lose my health care. I don't want to get forced into a government program. I like my health care the way it is. They may hold their nose and vote for Trump or not come to the polls. And not come to the polls is a danger. Now, having said that, don't underestimate Bernie Sanders as a campaigner. He's a very strong campaigner. He's very passionate. There's a lot to like about Bernie Sanders. And don't underestimate Donald Trump's ability to screw this up. The last question I have is, I know it's early, believe me, but a lot of people I respect say it's going to be a hot mess in Milwaukee at the convention. Do you think we could have a, a real mess on our hands there, uh, given some of the real concerns about Bernie and also how this math might work out? If Bernie wins 50% of the delegates coming into Milwaukee, th it won't be a hot mess. It'll be a celebration of, of the progressive wing of the party. But, you know, the media all said the Democratic Party has become way shifting to the left. Well, if you look at the primary results and the caucus results, the moderate candidates are getting 60 to 65 percent of the total vote. The progressive candidates are getting 30, 33, 34 percent of the, of the overall vote. Now, if the superdelegates respect that Bernie won the most delegates and vote for him, then Bernie's the candidate, and that has, as we've discussed, problems in its, of, of itself. But let's assume the superdelegates decide, no, we're going to give it to um, Amy Klobuchar. And Amy Klobuchar, who trailed with the amount of delegates won during the primaries and caucuses, emerges as the nominee. And the question is, then, do the Sanders candidate, uh, Sanders supporters vote on Election Day? Ten percent of the Sanders voters didn't vote for Hillary in 2016. Now, you say, well, 90 percent did. But that 10 percent was more than enough to win Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and make Hillary Clinton president. If that happens again, if the Sanders, 10 percent of the Sanders voters stay home, big trouble. Ed, I appreciate the time as always. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Richard. All right, everyone, when we come back, uh, we're going to show you more highlights from last night's debate and also discuss what Bloomberg could have done differently and may do in debate number two.